speech in Meskirch, which is his hometown, when he was quite old for the centenary of uh, Konradin Kreutzer, who was a composer also from Meskirch. Hmm. And he begins that speech by, first of all, thanking his hometown. All right, this is always where you can learn from Heidegger is gratitude. I actually took a note just uh, maybe half an hour ago. Hmm. Second, this is impossible for you to read also because it's German probably. It's the 2nd of August and I just wrote, what I have learned the most from Heidegger is gratefulness in a time of immediate availability. Hmm. And so he, first of all, he thanks his hometown. <clears throat> and then in this text where he says, you know, this is a Gedenkfeier, so um, we think of the person who has died in gratitude. But he says, are we thinking? You know, as usually, are we thinking at all? Right. But then he says that there's no way around technology. There isn't. And he says in that book, uh, sorry, in that short text, one has to, we have to let Electro technological tools into our homes mm. and say yes to them and we also have to say no to them so that they do not become what's authentically us or yeah. who we are so that they're not extensions of who we are right. because there's no point in demonizing them because they're not off the devil right. um, and is and that's this you know, in a sense, there's a term from Hölderlin, Shononian sobriety there's a certain distance to how we deal with these things. As long as they're not becoming us, then, then the relationship of, of master-slave is turned on its head. They just become what they could be, which is a tool. Right. And not as they are now, incredibly invasive and um, yeah. all, all in, uh, surrounding and seemingly yeah. powerful. And I think that's... And Heidegger also says what, what, what is happening right now is a, you know, uprooting and upheaval. That's the history for our time for, the, for maybe decades to come. And it's probably getting a bit worse. Maybe, I don't know. But, but within that epochal change or occurrence, there will be, there is a need for, for people to come about who can deal with technology in a way that it that there's a, a, a regrounding becomes possible right right so i mean that's that's right. great responsibility right? and response i like the english word responsibility because it because the because it comes from the verb to respond yes then responsibility we always respond to a to something that's challenging Yes. And that actually demands something of us. And even if we don't respond, then we're still responding. Right? Yes. Not, not, not being responsible is a response yes. to, to, to what's, what's going on. So, and it, it's probably, you know, I'd, I'd rather have uh, you and me and others uh, using technology than only Silicon Valley types who yeah. don't think too much about it. Right. Well, get them to think about it. Right. And yeah, I mean, if, it shouldn't probably become entertain. I would just, uh, not to tell you what, anything, but I, what to do, but if it, I mean, not maybe as entertainment, but do you do it with others? And do you, do you have circling sessions online with people? Um, yes. The, yes. There's other, there's other organizations that have, have done that a lot more. Um, but we are we're, we're looking at going more more online um, and experimenting with it. There's yeah. the thing I the thing that what one of the things I've thought about right is yeah. if I look at like there's there's ways in which there's like the little openings like with YouTube right um, that I think are, are really interesting and. And it's, and it's like when technology, because most of the time technology in its, in its, you know, in its mania, um, yeah. when something comes out, it's already, by the time you get it, it's already just leading to the, the next technological thing. It's like, it's a, it's a mania, right? But there's, there's, there's certain pockets of YouTube right, which is what we're kind of in a certain sense we're doing right now, where yeah. technology actually um, 
like brought up these kind of long form conversations, right? Which, which you get to cut. It's, it's really interesting to look at this where one, there's, there's people having just dialogues and conversations that meander for hours, right? That, that become present. So it's like, I think there's ways in which, um, like technology created, brought presence, right? Conversations between people that were like the opposite of technology, right? Which actually take something to kind of like listen to and you got to kind of struggle with it. Um, that's the part when I look at my own phenomenological experience, I notice that I actually, um, you know, like with your videos, right? There, there's a way in which there's a dialogue I've been having with you all the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because there's, there's listening to it, but, but then there's kind of the next video that you come out with and our next conversation. And there's this anticipation of that in the past video. There's a, there's a certain kind, it's interesting. I've been, I've noticing that like I, I have, I have people that I dialogue with in my mind when I go for walks and right that, and I'm anticipating the next video and it's like adding to the thinking that, 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 that I don't think I would have without like the YouTube, right? I don't think I would have that in that way. Um, so one of the things I take solace in is, is I think that seems to be one of the measures is like where if technology um, can bring something that's, that's, that doesn't, uh, doesn't inframe the thing that it brings. Yeah. Right? Uh -huh. uh, it, it discloses something else, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. it has a lot to do with this, this, this whole thing about like, um, cause I don't, I don't like yeah. dialoguing, right. seems to be the opposite of technology, right. In, in, in some, re some respect. It's, there is, there is that there's also about, about video or audio in general. It's hmm. all listening is very close to us probably closer than just seeing and these videos where people talk it's not about the video actually it's actually about people right conversing and talking listening and so logos is at stake uh, heraclitus in the first fragment says you know mm. we, people always are the many as he says always are in a hearing the logos but don't listen to it yeah in Heidegger, in, in that short text again, in, in the Gelassenheit speech, he also says that this speech is very likely going to be broadcasted immediately over the radio and newspapers, and it will be everywhere. Martin Heidegger gives the speech in honor of Konrad Kreutzer, and everyone can hear the speech if there's someone there to record it. But he said, and there's nothing wrong with it, he says, right? It's just how is it that such a such a recording is closer to us than the tree outside or the fields right next to where we live it's something you can you know phenomenologically speaking one of the what thinking back of um, my time growing up in germany i i grew up in a you know, city not not a big city but when i went to see my grandparents mm -hmm. um the villages usually they were empty mm -hmm. on a no one was children were playing outside. This is the nineties or eighties. They were to sit, they were watching TV. Right. right. So that that was closer to them than what was outside. And that's that's the strangeness of non the de distancing that's happening in technologies. But that's not to demonize it again. It's it's a question of again responsibility and how to respond to it and what's being given but then what's happening now is in heidegger so heidegger for example he did record um his conversations he had conversations with a buddhist monk right. he gave interviews that um for richard wisser who was a documentary filmmaker for example um and he uh recorded uh, herderlin's uh, poems mm. um so he wasn't opposed to it. I think what he says in that short text as well is that we need to 
it actually invites us, because you mentioned presence, it actually invites us to really listen. And then you're in dialogue with someone, as you said. You're, you, know, you go outside, you take a walk, and you maybe listen to something I said or someone else has said somewhere. And then you think about what could be, what could be the next, um, how, how does this fit into what I try to understand? But then, you, then we're really thinking about it and we're really listening. And if it's, it's not distraction, yeah. it's doing the opposite. Yeah. Right? So we are, it, it's, 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 perhaps it wasn't, and that's why, you know, YouTube and other channels are fascinating in a sense, because it's, it's not, you're not being told what to, the, the, no, no, no one's stopping anyone to, to make their own videos and try and make sense of what's going on. And of course, you know, there's a bit of a cacophony. It's, it's, it's everyone can say just about anything. And that's, maybe that's problematic too, but that's, yeah. there's too many layers to that to get to the heart of it. I think ultimately it's, it's there's a guy I know, uh, maybe you know him, Justin Murphy. Um, Sounds he's, a young, he's a young academic. He just left academia because he, he didn't want to remain in that. And he, uh, uh, Justin, made a, he's more of a delusion. He said in a recent video that, you know, as there's a certain collapse of meaning taking place or a meaning crisis. Is that, is that the guy that you, um, that interviewed you? The three hour interview, yeah. That's him? Yeah. Yeah, totally. That's, where I, that's yeah. how I found out about you. Then I would call, okay, good. So, you know, I would, so you could say nihilism or collapse of meaning or meaning crisis. Right. And what's, What's happening in it, what he thinks is on the horizon is that, um, and I would not, I, I will rephrase it because I don't uh, agree with the way he phrases it because he speaks of IQ levels and I don't think that that's right. real or anything. Um, he says it's just, you know, people who are, let's say, maybe more open to trying to make sense of what's going on and finding meaning in a way that's, more of a, you know, in a, in a very Heideggerian, Heideggerian terms, in a receivership and then in a, in a capacity to be a medium. Right. To, to re, re, rephrase it and then... A receivership and the yeah. capacity to be a medium. Yes, I think that's... Oh, okay. So like... I think like, that's what Heidegger means by, you know, to, like a, I, I guess a psychological or psych, neurological way would be you know the high iq people are more intelligent and therefore they can make snow <laughs> so mm. someone who for whatever reason is more of in a receivership not because there's anything special about them but maybe there's more suffering or something yeah. it's actually not not the, the greatest thing right? right to see what's going on and then also have having to being able to articulate something that's that's uh trying to carve out some meaning from something anyways that that would sort of uh uh in in that you know medium capacity or task of being a medium um that there is justin puts it differently but he says basically that those more capable of doing it they will become meaning makers for the next decades mm -hmm. and that's something that to a certain degree i think also is necessary Right. Because institutions are probably crumbling. Yeah. Um, politically, it's, uh, everything's a bit of a nightmare. Um, so, it, in, in, and then, of course, this meaning crisis. This is why people are flocking to people like Jordan Peterson uh, yeah. and others, because he, he provides or, you know, meaning to a certain degree and, and talks about archetypes, uh, etc., cetera, um, which is something that you're not confronted with, right? In, in the uncanny real work of Nietzsche, by the way, I gave a, I don't know if you've listened to that Nietzsche. Yeah. Nietzsche speaks of an uncanny real work. That's, that's our history. He says. Yeah. Um, uncanny real work. Yeah. Unheimliches Räderwerk, I think is the German and unheimlich in German is always this very strong word because it, it's unhomely, right? There's no sense of home, no sense of dwelling. And Heidegger often says this, this is it. There is no dwelling ground. Hmm. Let's not kid ourselves. It's quite desolate. 
but it's not decline. This age is not decline. It's not collapse. Um, mm. But it needs, uh, and actually, I think he's got. I think with technology, there's 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 two. There's there's. I mean, it's very difficult because he's he's written so much and he sees so much. But to a certain degree, I think there is in Heidegger's philosophy this possibility to find a relationship with technology that's less destructive than it maybe is now or right. can still become. Right. Um, and the other thing, because you mentioned he basically grew up in the 17th century. He was, as you know, born in, 18, I think, 1889, right. late 19th century. But it's true that in Meskirch, there, there wasn't any, there weren't machines or anything. It was farmland. Right. There probably was no tarmac on the roads, I would guess. Um, but then, think about it. He's 23, 24, when the First World War breaks out. So, and he's, um, uh, so, and that's the, a very destructive war. And so he, he, he's kind of the strange and lucky, it's, it's kind of, you know, what I always think is that we're actually quite lucky that there was someone like him who was traditionally trained in philosophy and theology and grew up um, on a village and, and didn't, wasn't confronted with any of this. Right. And then technology just kicks in. Like industrialization, it was already, of course, yeah. you know, everywhere, but it just kicked in in the 20th century full on. And he sees all of these massive changes. Yes. And then can bring that all to the fore. Well, while others were always just born into it, right? So we have someone, so it was almost like someone, a messenger from the old world, who's also in touch with and in dialogue with. Right. And this is the thing about dialogue, right? The, the strange thing about dialogue is that you don't need to speak to someone. Yeah. I've never spoken to Heidegger. I'm in dialogue with him. I mean, you know, as a right. As a listener, <laughs> but you are. I mean, you are, and, and and that's I think also what philosophy is supposed to do. Huh. It seems like yeah. It probably seems like the more people that you're daily in dialogue who are dead, the better. <laughs> Especially in our time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah, <laughs> I think that's think, probably where you were. You and I are kind of in it in a certain sense, in a rare position, right? In the in, in the sense that I can remember before the internet. Yeah. Right. I'm I I'm around a lot of people, and I'm around a lot of young people um, who don't have a memory before the internet, and they yeah. they, uh, they they really do seem like they they have a different language and a different. They're almost like a. They occur to me as almost like a different species. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm laughing because it's always this cosmic laughter when, in the face of something absurd. Right. Uh, which always <laughs> makes me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a few people who, who, who are capable of that, and that's good. But yes, I think, yeah, because there is something, there's something non human about technology. Yeah. And that's the first thing we have to understand is that this is not human mm. it isn't it's not just an extension of who we are it's like, you know the iphone isn't just a, a better looking hammer <laughs> yeah. Yeah. this if you don't see the, if, if someone who doesn't see a difference between the nuclear bomb and uh, a screwdriver right right and then, sorry you know go play somewhere else because this is this is just there's an ontological difference uh, that, that's, and there's a shift occurring. Um, and, and people who get sucked into technology too much, they, be, they become someone else. And it's again, you know, when you say they don't, they don't have a memory before the internet, you could, you could understand this, not just on a, you know, this, how we usually understand it. This is something we talked about last time, wasn't it? That they don't have a memory before the internet means their memory itself is structured by the internet or by the workings of what we call the internet. Right. So that means their, to a certain degree, their identity, their persona, their character is mm -hmm. formed by how they memorize who and what they are, what their experiences are. Right. 
these are very often immediately externalized and objectified uh, and, and or highly and framed right. and put in, put up for evaluation um, by others. And you know, to a certain degree, you can also wonder why do all of these uh, machines or these robots, these artificial intelligence units, why do they all thirst for evaluations? You have to evaluate everything. Yeah. And I think what's going on is that this thing, <laughs> if you like, whatever, whatever's doing this, whatever it is, however, maybe not what it is, but what's occurring there uh, needs evaluation. I mean, that's a very strange thought. Maybe, maybe it isn't, I'm not sure. But if you const if everything's constantly evaluated, then it can work with these um, with these estimates and kind of figure out how everything works. Yeah. Right? Do a quantification and right. then be begin to mimic and replicate. Right. And that's what it's doing. And then feed it back to us. Right. So maybe one of the things that we notice is that people more and more speak in cliches. Mm. In Heidegger, I mean, I, I, to a certain degree, language always does it, but that's it's maybe even more invasive now. So, but then that's actually, that's an invitation then to try and be even more, even sharper, mm. even, even more focused and concentrated and not distracted. Mm -hmm. And then it, it, it begins to form. And I think to a certain degree, this because there are things happening here in London. I'm meeting with people who are, you know, who look for exit strategies. Um, we are, we've connected, uh, you're connecting with new p younger people who are, you know, at the forefront of, you yeah. know, call it the culture war it's it's all of these things that you know they're kind of interchangeable yeah. um because what they what everyone is looking for is meaning yeah. and if that's springing up and it's, it can be very different it can be people who are who you know for them some of them it's political others is about justice others is about technology for me it's always existential ontological and historical um and I guess for you, it's existential and on that level. I, uh, and, yeah. Ontolo I think it's, I like ontology on my sandwich. <laughs> I was not to purchase, I'm like, no, man, I'm ontological. <laughs> Put some ontology on top. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. But by the auto, like, so by the, by what I think I hear is, is it's the, the meaning that um, points to significance, right? Is what you're talking about. Like is when you say like the meaning crisis of this, of this age is like, so I think about, it seems, it seems like meaning how I know something is meaningful is to the degree that I'm willing to suffer for it, for the sake of it, or I'm willing to do something hard or go beyond my preferences because something is, something calls that forth that, um, and it seems to me that technology, like Heidegger says, is like to the degree that it's technological is the degree that it collapses distances, right? It actually, yeah. Whereas meaning is more about a horizon that, that calls forth in which you, you actually, um, you get closer to by actually struggling with it, I think. Yeah. And, it, and it seems to me that the big thing about technology is the, is the man, especially, especially with God, some of these people that I'm talking to in Silicon Valley, it is just really weird. It's so autistic. Um, like the, like the, like literally the blindness, um, yeah, the blindness in the intolerance for any kind of struggle, the anxiety that comes up and the yeah. incomprehensibility uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. things like something like mastery, um, something that takes is, uh, that takes time and grappling yeah. with something and development. Yeah. They, it's like they, they're like, look, can you give me the three, three steps to optimize this, this, this thing? This process. Yeah. Cost and, da, 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 da. 
And so when they, um, so like right now, one of the things that we're doing in Google is we go to, I go down to Google. Um, I've gone down there three times and yeah. basically circle the Google people. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling that absurdity tickle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> but I think one of the things that we did is like we, um, the third time was the first time we actually did real, like just real circling. And yeah, it was quite, a, it actually was quite beautiful and striking to me. Um, yeah. And I think, because what they experienced, I, I, I think, was something that was not even something that they were resisting. It just wasn't in there. It wasn't in their horizon. There's a, there's a, there's a, a certain kind of like uh, openness that they have, but it's like a, it's a lateral openness. It's like uh, they're all very aware that they, they want to grow right and they want to grow as people and they want to be open to feedback and they want community um however like when with circling one of the like dimensions that we go into is the depth dimension right is is like not actually making things immediate available but actually kind of moving towards concealment and revealing that of like more of a depth dimension and so when they started to have that experience it was there was the opening of depth, but there was this other thing that happened, which was this almost this like striking destabilization of that there was a dimension like that <laughs> at all, right? Yeah. So it was like a, it was a, it was like a double a double kind of opening that happened, and did, did it, I hear that right? Death dimension, depth, depth, depth right? Can like you talk about so, death as well with them. What say it one more, one more time? Can you talk about death. Um, in, in circling, n not uh, not any anything planned or explicit. Okay. Uh, how did they did they reach out to you or did you ask them? Because if they because they might that that there's still an openness, isn't there? To a certain degree. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. There's an openness. In fact, if you go to the Google campus. It is what it is really something like it's a whole world. Um, they have showers, they have like gyms, they have re like multiple restaurants. It's all, all of it's free. It's, it's really quite something that they have going on there. Um, yeah. But they, yeah, the, how uh, one of the people who work there, um, wanted to bring us in and so the google encourages them to do kind of community building events um okay yeah and so kind of in that in that way that we got we got invited in and, and then what happens is that you help no not help me point them to and you put it you said dimensions um to dimensions that they had not maybe for a long time or maybe ever considered could be there with yeah. yeah so for example right would be something like remember with this one this one woman who was being circled yeah he was i asked her a question that she well, that she didn't know the she didn't know the answer to. Was that the video you sent me? No, no, that's uh, that was actually a. Uh, oh yeah, and I'd love to hear your. I would love to hear your thoughts on what you saw happen there. Um, I'm really interested to kind of like hear that. But then, we'll, make, we'll make a note and then. Yeah. But tell me about Google first, though. It's so for the, it would be something like where I would ask a question about like, well, what's how, how do you know to want that, right? And it, and she's like, I, well, I don't, I don't, I don't know. And I was like, well, what's the, what, what do you know in not, in not know, in not knowing? Let's see if we can just kind of be, get in a relationship with the not knowing. Like we're in yeah. fulfillment. And then just, first of all, 
that <laughs> what you can be in a relationship with that knowing stick like stick with it there's an it there's a just that whole thing kind of like short circuited it seemed like a whole set of assumptions that were really like just weren't a consideration okay what what are the assumptions at work so the so what i'm hearing is that the assumptions at work are not knowing does not exist mm -hmm. yeah right? that not knowing is not possible yeah I, I i have everything at my fingertip yeah i can just ha, 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 google yeah. it pun intended right sorry it was a bad joke, but right. but it's this. So the the assumptions on this campus, which is an interesting way of naming a you know a, a, the the headquarters of a corporation. Yeah. Um, which of course evokes you know associations at least of a university, which is a place for study and leisure, actually also for life of the mind, and not necessarily just being productive and contractual and transactional yes um so the assumption is and it's, it strikes them them as odd at least to say the least uh that there could be say, less a big word nothingness yeah at work or even possible within them yes and that's that's that and that leads to immediate anxiety doesn't it yeah it, it and also um yes like the unknown as a having kind i would say as has in, having an ontological presence to it right yeah. some way in which it's here or there um it's just it's it's there's something about their frame that just didn't include that right it's more like the unknown is just simply the place to program or to, to code or to, but the, the notion of like, okay, well, let's just sit here and just kind of be anxious then. Like, <laughs> like what, how do you know, what are we encountering such that, what is the anxiety understand? I mean, this is actually, this is ontologically and historically extremely important mm. to, to bring this to the fore how these people think yeah because it's google yeah right i mean if this were some random software people in the middle of no man's land who programmed some you know computer games or whatnot that had no influence but google is framing and end framing and ordering everyone who's online everyone's perception yeah. of the world yeah so it's probably extremely important to work out and make bring from the unknown from the concealed into a certain presence and understanding of how they how they make sense of the world yeah because you just said the unknown to them is is what's not yet been decoded or coded yeah yeah so so there, there couldn't there is there's almost like a trying to <laughs> i mean if you want to you know, Nietzsche says that the uh, that Platonism, this construction of another world, as he understands Platonism, mm. that's a bulwark for him against nihilism. Mm. And then you could say, rather than accepting anxiety and nothingness in his experience of of a loss of control, mm. um, or at least a certain uh, in incapacity for a moment of not being in charge. Mm. that's just coded away right? mm. well so they, the world to them is is data is information isn't it mm. it's and it's it's it only asks to be decoded and then ordered and then once and for all to be secured yes and this is an ex and this is a uh, this is something that i see present everywhere this is interestingly enough this is um this is marxist this is what how, marx never really describes communism um, but Marx just said, you know, at some point materially, everything will be just available forever. And then yeah. that's called total liberation of, of the means of production. That's just necessarily going to happen. Bertrand Russell and the video I made on him on, on idleness. Yeah. Um, I say at the end of it, it's the same assumption. It's once we've secured everything, 
then we can go and be idle, which means, right, which doesn't mean to do nothing, but which means to then, then we can go and find meaning in life. Mm. But only then. So it will take another hundred years. John Maynard Keynes, another Cambridge boy mm. uh, from, um, from, from, from around this beautiful island, uh, he wrote in, a, in an essay around the same time as Russell, sometime in the, I think in the 1920s, that we will from now on for a hundred years have to use usury and be greedy and awful to each other because then our grand-grandchildren will live in a world of plenty where they can live off substance. Everything will be secured. Right? So it's always about first securing all Interesting. Uh, data and everything. And then on top of them, but only then, can we live the, the leisurely life? And that means finding meaning beyond ourselves and finding again sort of a meaning in history. But it's, it's, if, if that's the thought, then you're always just, because it's, it, that, that will never f- come to an end. Right? Mm-hmm. And I wonder what the, the mindset, if you like, is at, at Google precisely, is that if, if they're actually working, sort of working, <laughs> To with first of all personally on, with a framework, but also as an institution, by it, towards creating frames that don't allow for anything outside of it, outside them, yeah. then this kind of gives an insight into Google that maybe is not there because you know obviously Google employs uh, philosophers, but right. these are usually in-house philosophers who just say what Google wants to hear, anyways. Yes. So they'll tell them, oh, look, there's a guy I know who's at Oxford here and he's now the in-house philosopher and he's a philosopher of information. Right. All he has to say is the world is just information. Let's, de- let's decode it. So that's what, you know, it's kind of feeding, feeding it's positive feedback. Right. Uh, just telling them what they want to hear anyways. Yes. But then again, what I find interesting about Google is they have Google Talks where they invite people like Noam Chomsky and I think even Shishek and others who... Might be yeah. not opposed, but at least you know, point to other words. So there is this openness still, but yeah, uh, it, I think as it, if you look at, sorry, it's like it, that's what I think. I think I'm talking about is like there's a there's a there's an openness that seems to be go this way. <laughs> it, it's like a flattened kind of openness. Uh huh. And it and what's interesting is because everything about Google, when you walk in there, speaks to non-hierarchy. Yeah. But it's so obvious that the whole thing that it's using to speak no hierarchy is completely weirdly self-denying, right? It's like, and so in, in the private conversations, almost everybody that I've talked to that works at Google, they're like, yeah, like Google wants to think that they're really open and liberal and all this stuff, but truly, like, actually, they're just, they're more corporate than anybody, right? And there's a, that's the thing that you can't say, right? I <laughs> think you have to say it in private. Um, so there's a, there's, there's this kind of thing about this kind of suspicion for depth, um, for, uh, things that take time and struggle, right? Yeah. Hierarchy in a certain sense, right? But this, but you know, you, you can spin this further when you so not wanting, and I'm I'm saying not wanting or willing yeah. uh, with a purpose, not willing for, for something to take time. Right. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about how time is speeding up, etc. But I don't even want to fall into that. But how is it that we that, that I think ultimately we have to get time right, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. and it's mm. it's not linear, it's not circular. Ecstatic is Heidegger's word, and I don't. One of the things to just Heidegger speaks about time much more often, but he, he, he doesn't fully develop, I, I think, how, how much further he could have gone with time. I think that's one of the, that's some of the work that needs to be done 
now is because there's, there's something that breaks open with him of how he understands time. But he says that being is presence, unreason, something, not something, but a, a, just a, a presence thanks to which beings appear in the way they appear. And time is the self-concealment of that presence. Yeah. The time is what works in that way. And we've talked about uh, history in some of the messages we've sent back and forth, yeah. right? How, how history also works like that. But if you have programs like Google, and Google is, is, a, is, is a program to a certain degree, right? It is, is an intelligence as well. Right. Um, what, what is it feeding off and what is it that it wants to build? So I'm not saying they, because that implies sort of that, you know, there's some evil conspiracy or no, no, no. It's just what is it, as, as Google or others, what is it that it wants to build and why? What is it fighting against? It's fighting against time. Mm. Yeah. It's fighting, and if, and if Heidegger is right, that time is concealed, not only, but to a certain degree, self-concealing and absconding, yeah. then they're fighting against concealment. And then we're back to this, you know, enframing of what technology wants to do. It wants to give you everything immediately as, as present and available. Hmm. But it, it isn't. Not even, so not even this conversation is perfectly present, right? Because it'll linger with us. We're only just as we're talking yeah. in this dialogue. Uh, and this wouldn't happen without us talking. I couldn't have this dialogue with just about anyone or with myself. No, it, it requires yeah. just the two of us and... And then it, and, and, but then its, its presence isn't just mm. this current moment. It'll recur right. as we, we step out of it at some point yeah. and come back to it later. But it'll, it's, it's, it, it's mind-blowing that if you think of time, and I'm just doing this now, uh, as Heidegger says, is something that actually does the concealing or is the self-concealing of every presence. Yeah. Then why is it that there's this, this suspicion against anything that takes time? You know how, how nervous we get when we type something into Google and Wi-Fi is slowing down or it's not spitting out the answer immediately. It's this, this intense anxiety already. Yes. But, uh, so I, I, wonder, I wonder that it, it, how, why is it that we have to work so with so much effort, I mean, there's so much energy going into that, right? Is that Google is a presence-making machine, isn't it? That's what it is. It makes everything present and available immediately, but not, you know, because there are different modes of presence. So when I say present, in that sense, it's this kind of inframing presence, right? Um, that that just presents something as just that. This is just this is the fact. This is the truth. This is the, the first result on Google. Speaking of hierarchy, I mean, sorry, Google is just by itself what it is, perfectly hierarchical. Yeah. Because everyone, everyone just clicks hit number one. Right. No one cares about page number two, mind you. I mean, yeah. On page one, maybe the first three is what I click. Right. That's it. Right. So it's perfectly hierarchical in that sense. Um, but if you think about how much effort and, and time <laughs> and... Uh, and energy of, of you know, obviously brilliant young minds has gone into so far, creating a world of non-concealment, huh. huh. of attempted perfect availability and immediacy. Right. And then you tell me just now that there's an anxiety when you talk to them, and there's this depth dimension. Right. And by depth, you could say there's a, there's, there are concealed dimension because you said they weren't even aware that they, those were there. You see, right. it's the sense of thereness that's concealed. Yes. Necessarily concealed. And this is also what circling does, isn't it? Circling, as far as I've now understood, and I haven't done it, obviously, it's just, it's just that, that you bring to the fore something that is there, but not there yet, yes. fully concealed. Yes. But then what, when, it, when, it's, when, it's, when it's set forth, brought out, shown, it, it's not grasped. It doesn't become an object. Right. It lingers for a moment. You can't touch it. You can't grasp it in that sense. Yeah. But it, it, then it moves away. This is why I, I think you call it circling because it goes in hermeneutic circles. Yes. 
and or even spirals maybe right yeah. and yeah. and <laughs> this is an insight into google i've never had um yeah. is that they the not they but some of the people you've talked to so far if they have this yeah, and anxiety, you could also say, if, it, if it's anxiety, then as Heidi says, it's only in anxiety that the nothingness of the world shows itself. Mm. But it's only when the nothingness of the world begins to show itself that we actually begin to grasp the horizons of the world, which makes the real, true world, and not this, and this is a quote from someone else, an unworlded world we live in now, where we have no... Uh, say, uh, there's a bit of a lack of place or a sense of where we really are. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I wonder what, why this fear of, uh, of concealment, why do we, we, we have to, we have to have everything at our fingertips. I think this is what all of these mechanisms or machines or I don't know what to call it. Yeah. are actually there for. Yeah, yeah. Is to ward off concealment. Is to get rid of, get rid of this, this these dimensions. Right. But then again, it you said there's a, a flat openness, and I think you also said something that I can't quite repeat now. Is that is that they didn't know there was something there, so they had never. So there's what what's lacking then. It's, you could translate that in psychological terms, maybe, and say what's lacking if you don't respect concealment is that look that you you can deny death you'll still die right and this is something else with silicon valley they all don't want to die yeah and these policies have been like, right you know it's, it's a pipe dream you know john gray a british philosopher he said to me in an interview six years ago he said it's more likely that the dead will rise from the from the earth or something. but yeah. um uh, it, 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 but so if you want to get rid of concealment, you'll conceal yourself from yourself. You don't self-reflect. Huh. Yeah. What's self-reflection? I mean, a proper self-reflection, I think, isn't just, you know, this Cartesian super presence of oneself as oneself. Look, this is just me. Bam, 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 bam. I, 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 I. Like, yeah. ich, this German philosopher, ich bin ich, I am I, and that's the first principle. And, Everything else just deducted from that. It's self-reflection is going into these corners, as Nietzsche puts it, of of the soul that are not there. Mm. I mean, in reflection, that you have to find. Right. You have to go look for. Right. Those are concealed. So. Right. The right. shot. I mean, you, maybe I'm taking this way too far, right? Uh, but no, maybe I'm, the, I'm really shutting, liking it. The, the, maybe that to a certain degree they're shutting themselves out. From themselves by not for allowing for concealment and absconding and the obscure and the you know the fussy and the imprecise and the the non-available right and the per the yes yes and the there's a there's also a quality too of like a a, a benign friendliness that's so fundamentally un like impotent almost <laughs> it's like everyone's like hey we're googlers they literally have they have little hats with a with like a like a little fan <laughs> literally and they have bikes they have you know um you know one speed bikes that are have all the colors in it they have uh, everything is about friendliness. Yeah. The flattening, where you don't really kind of walk away with any sense of anybody that you can remember. Like, that's that thing about, like, it's really, I remember, it's like, it's, it's difficult to walk out we're being able to remember someone's face there. Um, yet every, everybody is encouraged to commune right to 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 talk with one another to have community events um yet there's no it's it's just bizarre it's bizarrely uh frictionless 
in this, that's what I'm talking about. It's like flat land. I think it's like Wilbur talks about kind of flat land. It's it's faceless. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that's something you can notice with I mean last time we spoke I mentioned the shard building. Yeah. That's I mean, that's that's hideous. But many not 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 opposed to skyscrapers per se or anything. But it's if you compare that to maybe the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building, these are neoclassical. Right. Um, you know, the, and I don't care for these, you know, sexual interpretations of that. I, I think that's yeah. certainly really nonsense. But uh, they are neoclassical buildings that um, are statements, and they are the Empire State Building is beautiful. Yeah, I. And it's it's beautiful because it's classical. So it's not classicistic, but classical. I mean, it's sort of the classical is always capable of. Hegel is the last classical thinker. Hegel is a thinker who who accepts obviously contradictions. Right? He's a dialectical thinker. Mm-hmm. And what Nietzsche calls grand style is even even a step further, where the Dionysian and the Apollinean. So that, that which orders as the Apollonian and that which wants chaos and full life, mm. um, both of them are allowed its, its, its ways, knowing that you, you need both. Yes. And the task of, of the philosopher, of the thinker, is always to bring the two together and let them sort of do their thing, as we could say, do, do what they do. Um, but but only in relationship with each other, because then it becomes something beautiful. Mm-hmm. And what we want is just the Apollinean. Yeah. And those are the and and or not even the Apollinian anymore, right? Because then it, at least you would have proper form. Um, it's 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 something new. I don't know what to call it. But th- that facelessness is something I've I've noticed. Um, in what cities are becoming now they're becoming faceless mm-hmm. yep yep they're losing their there's character. no distinction yeah totally distinction right and and it's in in some way it's um been thinking about what you what you what you actually yeah I'm having so many different thoughts, and I the, the unfortunate part is I only have one mouth. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can you can ask some Silicon Valley guy to add a couple more. Uh, yeah, totally. Know. Yeah, um, let me grab some water, and I have to go pee. Okay.
It was great. <laughs> <laughs> Very untechnological thing. Yeah. 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 I um so the one of the things that you talked about in um I think in the in the the last video that you did. Um yeah, which I really I've been thinking about like it I've been noticing I've been going by churches and and kind of re going like those churches look somehow different. Um in the sense where I think you were talking about where Nietzsche Nietzsche basically said that I what I I think what I got was that the thing that was like the distinction that I really heard um was that in some sense, Christianity in the will to truth kind of led to its own demise, right? It, 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 in a certain sense, like, like the whole thing about, and I thought about with confession, like what's, like what's true, be honest, like really look at things that on some level that that, that actual, um, and then I saw, I was walking by a church and they say, God is truth, like was central. And then next, next to it, it was like in cement, you know, it was in the brick or something like that. It was an older church. And the next, uh, next to it was God is love. Yeah. And I thought about that sense of like, oh yeah, there's a way in which the will to truth, right. Um, in some, in some way, like led to the, the whole the questioning of of the premises and the axioms of the church and undid itself in some way, um, and how like Nietzsche like articulated that, or that's what I got from it. Yeah, um, yeah. And I'm I'm wondering about that sense of, and then then it talked about like, well, then at some point, right? If you just keep asking yourself what's true, right? and you keep willing truth, that at some point you get the willing, <laughs> the willing that's willing truth, and then that's the, now becomes the truth, and then there's this, you know, this kind of like, um, all, all the stuff that we're talking about with technology. Um, yeah. But just to think about that of, of cause I also wanted to talk with you too about, I was just wondering about what, I just notice I feel like when I when I hear about like the what's going on with with the church and how it's like so, like people are just dropping like flies, right? The yeah. amount and I feel so sad about that. Like and I'm surprised cuz I don't I actually I've never been had any kind of formal religious training or upbringing like yeah. none of that. But I just notice that when I hear those stats, I feel so sad. Like, yeah. Um, and I've been also kind of like looking at, like, drawn to these questions about about on some on some level, just this dichotomy between. Um, Like when God, like, if God's dead, the, it, it's almost like the, the, but the space of God doesn't go away, right? <laughs> right? There's still, if God's not there, there's still a there there on some level that somehow like, or like in concealment. And I just would, I'd love to hear what your, just what your thoughts are about like, and, and but there's also, I think some really good work being done in um, paradoxically in, uh, uh, in theology um, right now, like the guy, uh, David Bentley Hart. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with him? No. Yeah, I'll, sh I'll, I'll, I'll send you a, I'll send you a video, a, like yeah. some videos of him. He's, he's quite, he's really scholarly and he's fucking, just irritating as fuck um 
and he's got quite a sense of humor and he's just so arrogant, but he's so, he really, he really like, he talks a lot about Heidegger and he talks a lot about temporality and he, and it, and he's grappling with this, these, these deeper theological questions. Um, like what is the, so I, I've, I've been thinking about actually going in for some reason, I've been thinking about going in and actually going to, um, and I don't know why I'm, I don't even know why I'm thinking about this. Yeah. But like, uh, like going to an Orthodox church and then just going to the rituals and like, um, there's something drawing me there. And I, I think it has something to do, and I think one of the things that maybe attracts me there is just this sense of this kind of raping of concealment, right? Or the intolerance of concealment in our temporality. The, the, that sense of, it seemed, it seemed to me that, you know, the way that, I, how I understand Heidegger really talks about time is it's not future, present, past. It's more like future, past, like the gravity of the historicity has the moment show, show up, right? And that we're, we're losing a past, like we're losing a sense of history, of tradition, right? Um, and, yeah. It's, all that stuff is just disclosing itself as like shows up for people as just bullshit. Um, yeah, it, it, there's, there's a certain, there's, I think what technology does is uh, attempting to establish a uh, history lessness. Yeah, right. There is no history. Um, it's the eternal recurrence of the same becomes, uh, and it, uh, you know, and which, you could interpret as a way of speaking of time yeah. uh, coming from the tradition before you, we had terms like ecstatic or that Heidegger you know, spoke yeah. of. But that technology and the Heidegger says this uh, in the text that the, the true face of technology is that it's circling around itself. It's an ever, it's, it's the, you know, Mm. Re recurring of the ever same yeah and that's that's a that's an, a realm of there is no history there is no sense of coming from somewhere huh. and then there is no sense of going anywhere right and when you say you go to churches that's there's there's always you mentioned orthodox churches uh, that um, Russian Orthodox or Greek or Orthodox, there, there's a lot more maybe than in the other churches a certain sense for mystery yeah. that is lacking. And without that, though, without this perfect presence, you maybe you get to this uh, faceless, unreflected, uh, happy, but not so happy, really. Um, yeah weird places that aren't really places yeah is is the google campus a campus like oxford university is it similar is it inviting uh people to wonder and wonder and meander <laughs> or is it in a, in a way that's like professional wrestling is you know, like how professional wrestling, they're, they're, it's, it's acting. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everyone knows it's acting, but yet no one talks about how it's acting. I, it's, 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 it's very bizarre. I don't, I, I, I know it's in, it's, it, that's really popular in America. I don't know if it's happening in Europe. <laughs> Hulk Hogan and all those guys, right? Yeah, yeah. It's all scripted. Um, no one really believes it, but yet no one's saying that they don't believe it. It's like that, right? There's a... <laughs> That's fascinating, yeah. It's like, it's, that, uh, yeah. So I'm wondering about, like, in, in the sense of just your, que like, this question that, like, you, and when we were talking about with Google, as you, as you were talking about, like, why is it that we're so intolerant of concealment, right? 
Um, it's yeah, and I I I don't know why to a certain degree also from where this where thinking to a certain degree comes from is there's always presence at work. It, it's it's difficult to give. You know, there's no definite answer at this point, and I don't have one. Uh, it's probably to do with a denial of death. Mm. And maybe if you go even deeper, it is this collapse of the sudden uh, disappearance of God, maybe rather than the, the death of God. It's just because it's not, mm. I, I want to say it so much again. That's, so when Nietzsche says God is dead, this is very often, you know, it's very, the youths uh, would say, yes, wow, God is dead. I agree. Uh, but it isn't. When you actually read The Madman, uh, it's not a triumph. No. It, what he says is this, this, there's no horizon. He uses the word horizon. So when there's no horizon, that means there's no boundary. There's no limit. When there's no limit, there's nothing that pushes back against you. Yes. So therefore, you want to be in this ultimate uh, availability where you have everything not even at hand it's it's it, it it needs to be there without asking even without even it's there before you even have to think of it uh and it's it's also it's it's just it's destroying thinking but why is it happening it's i'm not sure why but you could perhaps say that um in in, a, in an age or epoch rather where meaning disappears um we hold on to or tr try to maybe build castles um that that if, if not ground any meaning beyond itself or maybe you know except for we're building a better world and all this nonsense um it, it, it's you <laughs> Yeah, it's I'm I'm not sure where it comes from. I can't at the moment. Maybe maybe I need to hear the question again so I can mm -hmm. jump in this because it's experimental. Right? It's your question that I was highlighting with the with just kind of there's something right on the periphery of of I'm just noticing that like kind of there's a way in which I, I'm oriented in the in the conversation which is this kind of this sense of like, basically, I think the question that you had asked earlier, which is in, in relation with Google, which is like, what is yeah. this, what is this in basically intolerance or anxiety around concealment, right? Like, and I, if, if this sense of just what you're talking about, like horizons, I love the notion of a horizon. <laughs> It's like I can think about horizons for God forever. Um, yeah. But the sense of having lost it because they're, it's, it's true. Like if I, I tried to get at this in a, like a little video that I made um, for my students yeah. when I just, I just took my phone and I pointed it on the ground. Like, and I was like, okay, so just get this experience. So like you're just looking at it. It's like an inch away from the ground, right? And you can't even tell that you're looking at dirt. Right. And then there's a certain point where it comes like, I, you know, I, I lift it up a little bit and then you can kind of see a rock, but you don't know what the rock is. And then you see a little blade of grass. And I was like, okay, now look at this right now, all of a sudden you get, Oh, it's the ground. But before, before you had the horizon of like the grass, you could see the grass, the ground wasn't there like in some yeah. way and then you go all the way up and pretty soon you see the ocean and you see the golden gate bridge and then you look back and now when you look at that there's so much more um in some way in some way there's a way there's a way that everything that's not present in what you're looking at right is actually um fills it up with the horizon of like, oh, it's in San Francisco. There's a place, there's an orientation. There's like, a, 
it animates, it becomes what it is. And without that, it's, you don't know what it is. You don't know where you are. You don't know what you're looking, looking for. And so there's this kind of sense of like, well, okay, like if, if like the, the horizon's gone, yeah, all we have is stuff, right? Yeah. All we have is stuff, uh, that, which is measurable and all, all of that. It, if there's concealment, what is concealment without a horizon? Like, like it seems like uh, with a horizon, concealment is is what the what the horizon announces, right? Because it's like it's what's it announces something beyond the horizon, right? That you move towards, but then the then the, the horizon becomes the ground because you can't ever reach the horizon, right? So there's this kind of sense of unfolding or unconcealment where there's a, yeah. where the unknown actually becomes something to move towards, right? And orient around, right? Orientation, that's it. It's orientation is, is, is Nietzsche says that, Basically, there is now a lack of orientation. Yeah, you, you cannot have cosmology. There are, uh, say, I'm not going to say the names, but there are people, people who are so-called continental philosophers in America who now talk about cosmology of black holes. That's meaningless. Right. A, a cosmos is a closed continuum. Yeah, that that is in itself meaningful, and a black hole is the exact opposite. <laughs> Of meaning <laughs> and it's 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 it, the, the moment that this the moment that the the, the the cosmos begins to collapse in modernity when, when the telos is taken away from the, the, the final cause so-called from from things right? right it's it begins to burst open and now we are where we're now where everything's just expanding and exploding for the sake of why, right? Why is the universe expanding? Well, because it's expanding. Yeah. Um, why? Um, and so uh, I think that with the horizon breaking, why do you think about this is Nietzsche, in the, I think, in the 1870s. In Heidegger in 1927 um, or 1925 uh, says, if there's, any mean, if, if there's any meaningful formula, it's not cogito ergo sum, it's sum moribundus. I am because I am towards my death. Yeah. So um, the other, uh, um, so I am because I'm towards my death. That's how I, that's where my meaning comes from. And then being towards death means not being towards a horizon because death is not a horizon. De a horizon, you know. Very strictly speaking, does have to do with um, with, uh, with with a, with someone projecting mm. and someone making sense. So death is not that, but death as an ultimate limit gives rise to horizon. And I think Heidegger posits almost uh, death as this, as you know, he says, almost possibility, ultimate limit mm. uh, that from which I receive meaning if I there to push myself into my possibility of not being right the possibility of the impossibility of existence that's how he, what he calls death i think that's his response to the death of god and this is not to to reduce us to our death or mortality or anything it's actually i think about us uh, realizing that in this epoch we have to come to terms with our finitude. And what's always struck me is that, you know, this is why it's important to hear about what's going on inside of Silicon Valley, yeah. is why are they working against death? Yeah. Um, and they are. Yeah. They're working against death because they're working against concealment. And maybe you've heard of this, Heidegger calls death uh, in the 50s, das Gebirg, this designs, and this is a very strange. So, in, in literal translation, this means the mountain range of being, right? Uh, and you could say that historically, we always stride through the history of being, which isn't which isn't the theoretical apparatus of you know. I'm just going to pull out this book. Ha <laughs> yeah. ha. This is what X said about being here in this uh, you know year. No, 
The history of being is our history. Science Geschichte is sign itself, being itself is historical. It's being historical. This is where we live. And we as mortals stride through the mountain range of being, which is death itself, is this concealment dimension of yeah. absconding dimension. Yeah. And why this you know, unwillingness to die, this not, not just unwillingness to die, I mean, that, that's psychologically something else than just trying to build the perfect cloud brain where I can up the singularity as Ray Kurzweil uh, fantasizes about. Yeah. Um, and, and the other, but, you, but Gebirg for Heidegger means um, the collection, no, sorry, the concentration, the gathering of concealment yeah. and not just concealment also sheltering and harboring and yeah. to a certain degree bergen also means bringing forth maybe so that's gebirg right so he, that's how he understands gebirg it's it's very you know uh, free in his yeah. approach to language but it brings something to the fore that's so immense oh so death is that gathering of concealment, it's death actually. So why are technologists working against death? Well, they're working against death because they're working against concealment anyways. Yeah. If they're working against concealment and time to a certain degree has to do with concealment, and we, th then they're also working to a certain degree against time yeah. and trying to build a timeless sphere, the perfect cloud that doesn't know time. And if, but, but, and, and this is the internet to a certain degree is this very strange yeah is, what is it actually is it, it's not a place medium that this that if you just spend time with it on your own it time just disappears and but not in the not in this ecstatic sense of that you, you get when you when you're extremely you know at, at the peak of your creativity where you, where you create something, time does in that sense disappear and become ecstatic. You become, you, you, you're maybe, you know, really precise and, and quick at doing something in a short amount of time. But then time just, it's just gone from when you binge watching Netflix, for example. It's all about killing time. This, yeah. isn't it? Uh, and I, this expression in English is just, again, uh, very fascinating to speak of killing time and this is not my idea this is um i, I forgot their names that the critical critical theorists from germany who say that uh the internet is the nunc stance and uh, this so sort of standing now um that's that's um still you know you can still transform it and, yeah. and um, but but it, it, it's not uh it's it's weirdly enough, it's, it's all, there's always something working against time and the time of human beings and how we are temporally in the world. And therefore, you know, it's, it's when you say that there's a lack of horizons, then that means that there is no world in that sense. Right, right. Because a world is, what is a world? A world isn't, as Heidegger always says, world isn't, you know, the, the, everything around us or it isn't it isn't just a, a collection of things mm. um, the world is the horizon or the background against which beings appear as meaningful yeah and 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 then that's that's something completely different from saying it's just, it's just data it's just information that's all stuff it's just all the stuff that there is right right, right. um it's yeah, I, I, I think that what, what, we're, what we're trying to do is in, in this epoch is build, building the, the total denial of the, of the meaning of the historical significance of the death of God or the, the, the disappearance of the divine. Right. Um, and uh, in, in that sense also, you know, this intolerance or even fear of concealment mystery and there's no sense of wonder and i i do wonder i mean you know as you know careers are aren't real <laughs> like i mean it's it's they're, they're fantasies yes created. but i have a a friend of mine whose son works for a major international corporation a very a 
a tradition, more traditional maybe than Google, that they produce actually something. Um, the son, a son? No, no, one of my friend's son. Oh, yeah. okay, gotcha. this, this gentleman, he's in his late 60s and he's got a 30 something year old son. Uh, and he said to him, look, that corporation you work for isn't real. It's just a fantasy, right? There's enough people who believe in it and it, it, it's there to make money and it pays you, it pays your bills and everything, but mm-hmm. you have to build up. And I think what, so what's, what's, what, what I think maybe one of the greatest threats uh, or dangers coming within the next decades is that the, the people forget to build up. Um, you know, they're building their careers and they're building yeah. maybe equity and blah, blah, blah. But we need to, we have to build up ways of making sense of the world um, that's beyond these you know, momentary, um, because it, it, everything's short lived and fast, and quickly there and then gone again. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it I mean, the, the collapse of meaning is also something that, you know, if, if you take it seriously and you want to be responsible, right. then you have to build up ways of making sense of the world that aren't crudely subjectivistic. Yeah. Another thing Heidegger always talks about is that let's not, we have to get rid of subjectivism. It's, yeah. That, then we're just stuck with, oh, you know, I, I don't, it doesn't matter. All I have to do is, uh, make say this is meaningful to me, and that's that's how consumerism works. Right. You you buy your identity. Right. You, you buy meaning um, for for a brief moment. Right. Yeah. I mean, but but to me, just switching yourself off for five or six or maybe even more hours on on a on a death machine like like Netflix, um, that's that's telling that this is happening. It's quite. There's something that that, that that something that's that's not. I mean, there's so much you know that there's so much capacity for people to to talk, but there's still not enough being said. I think about these fundamental dimensions of existence. Yeah. Where and of course you know the other the other danger is that it just becomes. This is what Heidegger says in the '30s. He says, you know, I shouldn't, <laughs> I shouldn't have written this book. You know, everybody talks about being, and that just means that being is forgotten even more. Yeah. So it's, you know, the, the, the strange thing is that if we, oh, let's just talk about concealment, um, that it, it, it becomes almost like an object itself. Wow. So it's not, so there's, there's, again, there's a danger of just turning it into something that then you make, one makes, I mean, uh, something we work with or operate with right, right. It, it's rather i think about a slow um building Love. of 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 ways so that there will be a time again we cannot will that to happen hmm. but such that there is now openings as i say in this this video lecture hmm. openings in history again that can come about, but it's a slow build-up to that. And then, you know, you, a sense of wonder, um, a sense of mystery, those will come back perhaps, um, but we can't will them to come back. Uh, and we, we, yeah, it's, and this is this, yeah. So I think Heidegger, to, to maybe summarize what I tried to say, is that Heidegger, I think, responds to the death of God by making us aware of our mortal finitude yeah. and, and saying without that, we don't have a horizon now. This is what constitutes our horizons, is our finitude. We have to be aware of it and not work against it. Um, this is where meaning could arise from, from being mortally finite. Rather than, as Nietzsche says, you know, where are we? We don't know where we are, we're floating. Um, and Nietzsche says he speaks of the eternal recurrence of the same as a heavy, no, the heaviest weight. That's that, because we're we're floating away, and this sense of, of floating maybe that's 
you could maybe translate that as saying that there is no depth dimension or they're not that there's no awareness of of other dimensions of what they have immediately present about themselves yes. Yes. which is their career in silicon valley which is you know it is pursuing the, the, the ladders they climb up or pursuing yes. certain things that are are in this you know time period yes extremely important and hierarchically uh, you know this, this great status that comes with it yes um but the, but this yeah this lack of 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 um kind of appreciating that not everything can be maybe you know quantified etc that's hmm. striking i think i think about like a oh, couple things a couple things one of the things i just i appreciated this about about our conversation last time, and appreciating it again about what you said about the the I think you quoted Hegel in the saying that the philosopher dies of worry <laughs> every day, every day, right? Every day, I and I really feel I feel that in you, right? I feel like it in a there's something. And the thing I wanted to ask you about too is when you, in the beginning, you said, yeah, I just wrote down this thing in my journal, your journal, right? Like yeah, yeah. thanks and think, right? And yeah, what is that? What is that, that like, what the, that, what, what how do you write that down? What what is that that's what is that that that's moving, right? Through what is this thing that's like having us just go mad in the conversation, right? Like because there's so many I, yeah. for, for you, what is that? Uh I have no idea. This this um it just comes. Yeah. It yeah. just just come these thoughts are just all of a sudden they're there and it, it yes makes sense so i'm i was outside i was taking a walk and just all just all of a sudden opened up and i thought of gratitude in terms of how consumerism makes gratitude impossible because everything's always there and you're not you know you're not grateful for 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 an ikea glass or yeah or yeah. Uh, uh, you know or anything really who who Who's who praises the Lord or anything or anyone for the food they eat? Right. It's you know I mean, yeah. uh, and that hit me today, and I thought, I thought it, 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 uh, there's a lack of gratitude, um, and and what you can learn from Heidegger is how you know you know he's been he ridiculed for saying that denken is stanken that thinking is stanking. Yeah. And it's very easy to ridicule that. But what's much more difficult is to appreciate it and to actually appreciate also that beauty in hearing that in language. Because who says that, you know, it, words just mean what the dictionary tells us and it, that it, it's not possible to hear something in a word that no one else has heard maybe before. Yeah. Why, why, would, why would be denied? Why would that not be allowed? Right. So uh, who, who's decided that? So thinking is thanking. It means, first of all, there's a, a gratitude for being able to think at all. And then I think this, this, the stance one can take um, is, you know, when he thanks his hometown, he thanks his hometown for being, <laughs> mm. for, for being there yeah. for, so that he could be. Right. And, and he, there's, I think, uh, at some point, he said to his brother uh, that it thinks in me. Huh. He, he wrote, as you know, yeah. hundreds of, of volumes. Yeah. Um, there's about 100 published now, and there could be more. Right. Um, and it, it's, it thinks in me. And if you ask, what is it? Maybe to, to be strictly Heideggerian, maybe it's, it's what he calls uh, Eignis, um, which is not perfectly translated as event. You know, Eignis is more 
So it's not, first of all, you cannot translate. There's no English equivalent. Yeah. So there's no word for just like logos. Yeah. Dao. There's, we, don't, we, we cannot translate Dao into any Western language. That's no. not happening. Um, and Ereignis, uh, you could think of, and he does that, as coming into its own while disappearing and absconding. Mm. Coming into its own while disappearing. It's a, it's a realm, he says. Um, like a, yeah, a proper realm where being and the human being meet. Mm. It's, it's, the Ereignis is not a substance or anything. The Ereignis is that which that which throws itself yeah. and catches itself. Yeah. That's how he's experimenting with you know, ways of thinking, Ereignis in that sense. And it's, um, Ereignis, he says, is what all of metaphysics has always responded to without knowing that that's what it's responding to. And that's how you get to the epochs of being and the history of being. Mm. It, it, it could, perhaps it's... Uh, possible to say that within Heidegger's thought that what's taking over or what's inviting us is that what Heidegger calls an Ereignis is a certain realm where their being and that also means history and possibilities of meaning and horizons meet with the human being and then we become uh, we become not not the because we're not the agents of history Right, so that's that's what humanism would say. We're we're kind of we're the center of everything. What we do will lead to this and that. No, it's how we respond to what's going on that feeds back into it and that comes back later on. And that that's and I think all great thinkers say that Nietzsche certainly says when he has Zarathustra say, um, "What was it? Silent thoughts move the world. You know, beware of what comes on dark's feet." It's it's not. Um, it's silent, almost silent notes that make, and again, this has to do with concealments and, and non-availability. That's, that's how history comes about. And that's the Ereignis, as it were, itself. Because it, it's, it's this realm where this, this possibility opens up. Um, and, and when we respond to it, we respond in a way to it currently, if even more, more than ever, where we try to make everything available for us yeah. but then there's another layer to that which is what's what's making us do that isn't us it's 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 distinctly non-human um what what happens in technology yeah. um yeah why because w once once you work against uh mortality you are working against what it means to be human. You, you, you're trying, one, you know, it, it's an attempt to eradicate uh, what, it, what, because it, 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 it takes away uh, that dimension of our history that is what we all suffer through. Yeah. Um, and that makes anything ultimately meaningful huh. is our encounter with our death. Yeah. 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 And then you create this, this fake realm of, of, uh, of, of, you know, a deathless sphere, which is also, as you described it, faceless. Uh, there's no distinction. Right. Um, and it, this is slowly, coming about right no not everywhere you know because you could say the that that's you know unevenly distributed it's not everywhere it's it's not that and that's another thing of beauty is that it's not all powerful oh. it it's not everywhere but it, it's sort of right. slowly showing itself that that's a possibility of of what could be coming uh, or is uh, you know, announcing itself um, but then again, it's not, it's not fatalism. It's, it's just that we, the way we, we respond to it changes, um, you know, feeds back into what's happening and then comes back from behind in waves. Huh. And 
but you know if you ask personally what is it i have no idea it's always been there and if i don't think or write or uh -huh. have these conversations i would i would not i would not be able to uh exist it's not yeah. i have to, there's no there's it's not a it's not you know oh i i, I today i'm going to sit down and think about death for 10 hours right 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 it, it's it, there's there's no it, it, it's not I don't, I don't want to do any of this but that doesn't mean that it, it's it just in psychological terms you could say it's a pull yes it's something pulling right i'm not quite sure what but yeah and it's the cut the thing you you said about nietzsche about history in the silence in the silent notes of that yeah like that again that thing about listening right just that and and yes so listening so you you could even say that you know his, history isn't this this uh one event after another succession of big stuff in the news or anything uh or whatever is in history books that's so weirdly enough part of it um but but there is a there is a melody to history and i think what heidegger wants us to make us aware of again remind us of is that there is this lingering melody that we can begin to hear and then it slowly begins to make sense yeah it's and there are there are these beautiful artworks like for example goethe's faust which is yeah. One, if you want to understand modernity, that's one of the one of the texts you have to look at. Is Goethe's Faust? Okay. Um, and wanting someone to tell me about Faust. Well, you know, it's it's the Faust impact is the devil comes to Faust, who is a learned man, uh, who uh, aspires to know everything, to have absolute knowledge, and he. He's not satisfied with anything. I can get no satisfaction, right? So he uh, makes a pact with the devil to achieve, first of all, youth, and then also to seduce uh, a young woman and destroy her life. In so, in a sense, it's destroyed, uh, all for the sake of uh, gaining absolute power and knowledge. It's a it's a story of the will to power, if you like, yeah. and. But when you um, when you read it, one of one of these texts that are you know first of all beautifully written and some of the most beautiful German ever written, of course, it's Goethe, our our national poet. It's there's something else that that happens. Um, you know, it might not, it, there's something that occurred to me over the, for the first time that maybe six seven years ago when I read it again and also uh, saw the, the play um on stage is that there is this deep web i think you can say in english this deep web of meaning mm -hmm. uh, that's not ever you cannot google that right you, you could read every you can have you could, you could scan every single book in the world like google books and it no one you cannot pick up on it from if you think it's all just information and data there's something else that's working its way in history and it sometimes lights up. And that's where we need to get close to. And to a certain degree, this epoch then is, you know, meaning is never just given. Meaning was never just given. This is something I wanted to say as well before. And I, is meaning always has to be found and wrested from something else from, so it, if you're just given meaning, you're, you're, then you are, as Kant would say, you know, you are, uh, you're, what is it? Unmündige, I'm getting lost in translation. I think, you know, you're, you're uh, self-inflicted uh, ignorance or something, I, I think would be the English. I'm not quite sure right now. Is that then you, you, that you need to question. Right? Being remains a question. Seinsfrage yeah. is, a question of being but the off is not a genitive objective so that the being is not an object here but being is the subject being is what's doing the questioning 
Right. Being asks us. Right. That's what's happening. Right. And and, and we're we're brought closer to to it in the moments of of anxiety, of facing death, of running forth towards death, as Heidegger says, um, than when we deal with what's immediately there and available. Yes. That, that, because then we're trapped in a, in a presence that, that only knows itself, that's only aware of itself, but not aware of the ecstatic moments that, that made that presence possible in the first place. Yes. And that's where we are. We are, we are in, a making, in, a, in an age of making present. And Heidegger says in Being in Time that if you make everything present, um, then you're stuck in, 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 um, in, in an unquestioning, non-understanding tr- trap. Yes. Right. right. There is no hearing. You don't need to hear anything. You don't need to... Th- why? Because you, you have everything you need. Right. Supposedly, right? Yeah. But what, 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 I think what, 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 what we're looking for ultimately is those who seek is, is this other, this, this what's no longer possible in this uncanny wheel work. And you know, the, when Nietzsche speaks of an uncanny wheel work, he doesn't say that it's ugly. He doesn't say that it's, um, it can, it can look very, you know, aesthetically pleasing as maybe a Google campus is on the face of it, you know, quite friendly and colorful and the other. Yes. Uh, but that can be an uncanny real work too. Yes. If, um, there's maybe a sense of uncanniness about it. Yeah. It's yeah. unhomely. Right. Right. That's okay. what's meant by that. Right. So, so we, 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 when, when I say real work, we imagine like a big machine and it's, Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin. Um, but you can be an adapted wheel and, or a cock in, right. in, in, in an unholy non place uh, yeah. as well, where you don't have to, where you just go un, un, you know, unquestioning. Yeah. Um, that's, always, that's always the problem, this non, non questioning yeah. step. Because non questioning means there is no, there is a lack, say, of an openness for when something attacks us and, and asks us to question what is. Yeah. Yes. And th- so th- these are, uh, and it all, because even that, so even that moment where something asks us, where being asks us to respond, mm. those are moments of, of not, you know, in that sense of, they're not available. They actually, they happen in concealment. It's not, it's not clear where it comes from. So it comes out of concealment, if you like. Right, right, right. That, I just, as we're, as we're talking, I'm just kind of getting this sense of just, just remembering, like, at least for me anyways. Yeah. Um, Meaning and mystery are like the same, almost like the same thing, right? Yeah. So you could, you, you know, you, yeah. You, I get, yeah, yeah. I guess you could say that. Yeah. So they're not the, they're not equivalent or identical. Yeah. But they are in in this beautiful play. Yeah. Where. <laughs> right. Where, look, if if I just if I. <laughs> um. We could. I guess even this conversation between you know these weirdos here, uh, someone could someone could write bullet points, right? Uh, German guy says this, American guy says this, right? Boom, 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 um, and then you don't have to listen to it. Yes. So you're given the meaning, the significance of the conversation in bullet points, mm-hmm. um, but. But that's nothing. That's nothing that's being disclosed by that. You're just given something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If you're yeah. given meaning, yes. And this, by the way, all of this is the oldest problem. It's the cave of Plato. Right. It all comes back to that. They're given, and this is something. How the, the way that the, the cave is taught is false. Right. 
because usually so you know it's just educational he's just trying to explain his theory of forms yada yada um or um you know the, the shadows aren't real don't worry no they're real that's the thing shadows are real what what plato is after here mm. is this strange old problem mm. that there can be beings that aren't really beings that have a very difficult um uncanny again ontological right. status right and so where we are with the cave is that plato to a certain degree also traps us in the cave mm. and the prisoners anyways they are given meaning mm. that's why they're prisoners mm. they're, they're imprisoned by their unquestioning stance that they assume right and all they do is without ever asking to, so, you know, there's concealment at work just by the very fact that they never turn their heads to see what's behind them. So that's already a level of concealment um, or a dimension of concealment, if you like. And then they learn by heart the shadows that pass them by. And that's what structures their world. That's, that's where they get their so-called meaning from. Right. Their existence, you could say, is is pointless because there's they don't ask what's beyond this there's no transcending themselves and trying to leave the cave there's only one of them who does and he faces death when he comes back down right yeah. he faces yeah. the death by hanging because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right. he, he, he dared to leave so right right so we have to be very careful to do. anyway <laughs> <laughs> totally yeah, yeah. So it's it, it and the, so to a certain degree we're not saying anything new because it's always been the problem right but, but what plato's cave when i was uh uh six, 15, maybe 16 i don't remember i whenever i read it first and i read it in greek mm -hmm. at school it, it, back then already and this is almost 20 years ago it hit me that this is our age how is it possible that a thinker mm. 400 before christ or so describes television radio uh and the computer mm. cinema how is that right so you see we, we, we maybe maybe that's uh a way of of getting into this understanding of how history works. Hmm. Yes, yeah, say, say that again. So, how is it that? And that's just an open question. Yeah. How is it that Plato describes something that not only you know it reminds us today of television, of yeah. cinema, yeah. of yet now certainly also smartphones and the internet right well we, we we deal with shadows yes but these shadows are real they make up our world we scroll through instagram and oh oh i want to be here i want to be this i want to go there yes um they, they structure how we see the world so you see the shadows are extremely powerful right people who spend their lives staring at screens trading whatever that's not real to a certain degree and that's but it then again it is mm -hmm. uh it's so what's i think the the open question here is how is it that what is history if if not this slow way <laughs> crashing or not crashing but mm -hmm. uh, waves moving from behind us and, and coming at us from from behind i mean the, the cave is only just now coming towards us yeah from behind but towards us because we now have to deal with it yes. on a level that no one else had to deal with before right 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 so <laughs> right. yeah
so interesting. I had like, um, actually I wanted to ask you too about this, about one of the things you talked about last time was how, how academia was awful, <laughs> right? Um, and I would have thought, you know, it's interesting. I would have thought that the kind of conversation that we're having, right? Um, I think without even reflecting on it, I didn't really even think about it, but I just, I was surprised when you talked about that this was um, this way of dot, like connecting in this way was rare. Yeah, because it's, it's rare because um, there's no competition. Uh, there's, there's, there's just an interest in talking. Yeah. Huh. I'm, I'm not talking to you to overpower you and show you that I'm right. Yeah. And, or that, or, or the other way around, or even just to teach you something. I mean, I'm not teaching right now. Right. I'm, just, I'm trying to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and that's, unfortunately, I mean, not the case in institutions of higher learning. Huh. And you, you had, you had, um, the, the person that you went, you, the person that you had interviewed that, uh, that guy who said like, yeah, Justin. Yeah. He said, yeah. He taught, like he taught Heidegger in a particular way that people didn't necessarily like agree that that's the way it be, should be taught in that way. What was, how does, how did he, I'm so curious about this. Cause I, oh, you, know, no, no, no. you mean Ivo de Chinaro. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. The guy, the guy that was talking about, um, uh, you had interviewed him. I think he was, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I really like that interview. Like I've listened to that a bunch of different times. Like, um, but what, I, I'm just so curious about this because I, I'm like, I, I've just been over here alone, like trying to read Heidegger and I haven't really had anyone to talk to. <laughs> I, don't I, don't how, I don't know how people approach it. Like that, this, one of the things I like about YouTube is that like, there's actually people, this is the first time I actually heard people discuss Heidegger in some sense, right? And like, yeah, yeah. But like when you, was it when you started to engage with with Heidegger? Was it was it with him in in yeah. in the university? Can you share? Like, what was that like for you? Like, to a certain degree, he never mentioned the name Heidegger. He uh, it, because it doesn't matter. Ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the way though he it was. That thinking is, is not Heidegger's thinking. It, what, it, I had ancient Greek and Latin at school. Yeah. And especially the, I was, I mean, I, I was better in ancient Greek than in Latin. Yeah. Because the Greek way of thinking is closer to me than Roman thought. Roman thought is very superficial. It's a lot about decorum. It's, it's their copycats basically. Um, of Greek culture anyways um, and you know very theatrical as Italians are up until this day right? yeah, it's, like this sense of theater, it's all theatrical everything is dramatical um, and they're, they're kind of serious about it but not really yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes it, it, <laughs> fascinating that that's <laughs> anyways but uh, um, so that, when Iwo de Janeiro taught philosophy, that way of thinking that I had become familiar with in studying Greek, the mm. language came back. Mm. And so you didn't even have to mention Heidegger's name. So what I make of that mm. is that the way Heidegger thinks isn't, you know, oh, is it so radically different and new? No, it's, it's just... The way that Greeks think and the, the way that ancient Greek thought worked mm. and how 
thinking itself works and it's the question of being is not out of this world it's a it's a question for meaning it's a question for existence yeah. uh, it's a question of history and it's reminding us that there's something else beyond that you know not beyond the metaphysical sense now, but you know that, that we're not grasping at the moment we're right. not even looking for it. right and and the other thing with, with with you know teaching heidegger is just what i would say is um the question is do you take it seriously or do you just use it to as an ornament or as as sort of a, a good way to start an academic career right uh, or someone to argue with right you know i'm reading heidegger critically i mean yes you can you can read anyone critically that's anyone can do that yeah and that's not Point. I mean, I can sit down and say, ha ha, Hegel, mm. oh. you know, uh, you're, th this doesn't make any sense. And no, what you're trying to do when you think is you approach it from the, from the perspective of necessity. There is a necessity to Hegel coming along after, after Kant, who speaks in the critique of pure reason about the antinomies of reason. That means that reason itself can't admit that reason always traps itself in contradictions, but then wants to get rid of contradictions. You know what technology is? Technology is the transcendental logic by which we construct subjectively non -contra uh, objects without contradictions. That's why everything's so boring. Huh. We are all bloody transcendental log yeah. logicians according to to the laws that Kant finds, finds, not establishes, but finds in the possibilities of nature and history. Yeah. And then Hegel says, you can't, look, you, he says, look, Emmanuel, you do admit that there are contradictions, so let's take them seriously. And that's why he's a classical thinker. Yes. And let them uh, play out. Huh. Just to arrive at truth, you need to have being and nothingness. Yeah. Um, uh, and, and then Heidegger is another necessity. I mean, we could talk about that some other time, but it's just, if you take it seriously, this thinking, then there's a necessity to it. The way we approach it now in this hyper-intellectual huh. world we live in, it's, oh, it's just, you know, theory. It's just something to, to right. read critically or to write a paper about that's interesting. But Heidegger says somewhere, he says, you know, everything's interesting today. Yeah. But what does it even mean? to say that something's interesting, right? It means yeah. nothing. Nietzsche says, and I quote this in the lecture, he says, we're all interested, but we're all just epidermally interested. Nothing touches us, really. It doesn't go under our skin. We're all, he says, what are Europeans? They're spectators, historians, interpreters, all reactive talents. They're not active. They're not acting. They're not trying to build and create. We're trying to just respond and respect, you know, look at something and then react to it and that's kind of it's comfortable you know but it doesn't really it, it's it's kind of weird because you know it doesn't it, transform you yeah yeah it doesn't transform you yeah right totally it's like this understand this is a thing i think about i think about um with reading I mean, most of the continental philosophers, I mean, definitely Heidegger, like, um, I've understood, it's weird. It's like, it's so interesting because I'm realizing that the, what, I, what, what hangs with me or where, um, well, actually, you know, who talked about this was, uh, uh, what's his name? He's the, ecolo he's the cybernetic guy, um, Gregory Bateson. And he talked about like the difference between like a blockbuster movie and an art movie, an artful movie. And what, and what he would say is like, you know, when you go into a blockbuster movie, right, you, you go in one way, right? Yeah. And then there's like the, right, the opening and then the build up, right, and the tension and then the crescendo and the orgasm and then the happy ending. And then, and then you walk out exactly the same person, right? And where he said, uh, the more artful a movie is, is the more you walk in one way and the movie opens up these tensions, right? And to the degree it's artful, as he would put it, is to the degree that by the end, you're left with 
something unsolved with a tension that's there's an in there's no like crescendo and da, 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 da. it's like you're left with unresolved things such that you walk out right um and you actually have to kind of live the completion of the movie right so you're, you're you walk out a different person um, yeah. with a different set of horizons and i i think that that's the thing that i really where I find, you know, we talk about, well, what are some ways of getting access to this kind of ecstatic temporality? Yeah. And, um, which I actually think that there's a, I think that there's a listening for that, right? Of, there's, a, there's, a, there's a listening and a desire to have like an experience of that, right? What, what, is, it to, what is it to live time or to be yeah. lived by a kind of time or a different sense of time. I mean, that is just yeah. <laughs> you no, know, unreally yeah, like that's, that's, exactly, that's it exactly. And I think it, it it begins for us as 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 humans. It begins with language, a yeah. certain yeah. a certain carefulness about right. how we speak. Right. Um, and you know, not say I don't have time. Right. You, you never have time. First of all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you think you have time, time just had you, right? <laughs> you cannot save time. That, that, what does that even mean? Right. Show me that bank account where you've saved time. Right. That that's not there. So it's not a stock <laughs> that you take or 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 save or not. No, let me just not use time for now. No, that's not how it works. So time, and if you if we only speak in terms of saying, Time is passing, it's passing you by. Oh, time and, you know, no, it's, let's just say, and this is something that's very strange because we always want to have, you know, what's the result? What's the outcome? What's the objective? What's, how is it true? Can you, what, what's the correspondence truth to that? Let's just say time arises and gifts itself. Time gifts itself. Time gifts us. What it, it just, I think that in itself is transformative. Yeah, all right. You keep telling that yourself. I'm, I mean, I'm certainly not doing that every day, right? It's something I have to remind myself of as well, right? Because we live in clock time, yeah, which is fake, yeah, that's actually fake. I mean, that's you know, not time, time is not fake, that's stupid, that's a stupid leap that people make. Oh, we've invented clock, so we've invented time. No, <laughs> no, sorry, uh, time is a bit bigger than you. But clock time, to a certain degree, is fake. You, you cannot equalize time. You know, this is why you, know, you get, get to all these shenanigans about how time is relative and blah 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 blah, and how it feels. Yes, but it's not relative. Time isn't relative because if it's relative, then it would be relative to some absolute, and that's not what's happened. Time is it's. I think for now, I have to think a lot more about time. I think what an exercise can be is that one says, time arises, time gives. Yeah. And, get, and then move away from saying time is passing. Just say time arises. And that, that is, I, you know, it, it's beginning to transform. And it, to be honest, it feels, uh, when I say it, there's quite a sense of, of um, I don't know. It's kind of soothing, even. It's it's very. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? Yeah, it's you like time like, passes. Like oh my god, I'm running out. <laughs> I need to go get some more time. Get get me some more time somewhere. Um, or you know, I don't have time. Boom, it's gone. It literally, it's it's very strange. You get, the time arises. Time gives. Right. There's, there's a quietness that comes over me. A certain calm. Yeah, I start to like listen. I start to, to yeah, I start to listen for the silent note. <laughs> Remember? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> that lingering. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That. I was thinking about like so my experience in this. You see, you mentioned Goethe and Faust. Um, I'm most yeah. familiar with Goethe through his scientific work which is just wild right um just the fact that the guy created 
new sciences. I just like it. And also I heard, I heard somewhere that like Gerta has like, uh, somehow they're able to measure this, but like Gerta has, has used more words in his lifetime than any other person. <laughs> like they did some, some list. It was, it was interesting of like, you know, I think it was about genius and, and language and yeah, they showed like the, you know, and the person below him was like 40, you know, 40,000 and Goethe was something like 150,000, right? Yeah. Goethe is fascinating to me. Um, just the, re like the range at which he, he operated. But so my understanding of like what his work with biology, right, was, was analogous to, to reading a text. You know, you'd say that, you know, and for the most part, when we look at, um, you know, human, human made objects, um, we actually don't, we don't, we don't uh, look at them and perceive them. We read them. Like we, we, we see a chair because we, we read the functionality of chairs. And because we have the correlating distinction, right, we can, we can see the chair and we actually read it, right? And so just like with reading, you don't, you know, and he said, he said so, so like in the, human, in the human world, there's this way in which we have the corollary, con, as he would say, the concept meets the precept, right? And that, that those coming together is the, is, the, is the experience of the world. This is a... But then he was, he said, that the, however, with nature, right, he said, we don't, how we try to understand nature is not by reading it, right? How we try to understand nature is like, as if we were like opening a text and we were measuring the shapes of the letters, right? Yeah. So like, um, because we don't, and so I think the thing that he was, the talos that he was approaching with this was, seeing uh, nature as a sacred text and that, that to give one's, like to give one's perception, it's actually to give one's eye, right, um, over to nature and that if you could fully give it over to nature, and he had this whole way of doing this, of like how do you perceive the, the species, right, of like in botany, like, that the actual, like the revelation of the science was yeah. to be able to like fully give over your sense of I am to nature. And that if, if, you, could, if you could fully discipline your perception in, in that giving, yeah. it light up, right? It would, you'd experience it's in a certain sense, it's um, idea, ideality as an experience. And you could perceive the, that which runs through all oak trees that give oak trees that you can actually read the meaning of it in some way. Um, and so there, there's a, and I think that's maybe some, some uh, gives a hint maybe in, in towards the way that we can kind of enter into these, these, cause I think that's, that's a quite a, that's quite a, that's quite a wild, sense of temporality <laughs> right when you think about it <laughs> and so when i look at that and, and, and this is why it lights up for me is because i was just reading i was reading ister uh heidegger i think it oh it's down here right the the ister um i was at the i was at the plan well i was at the you know the so funny i'm like sitting here reading heidegger in the waiting room to, because we're trying to have kids, um, yeah. my I've been meditating too much, so my sperm don't swim anymore. They're too equanimous. Um, <laughs> the doctor thinks it's because of my age, but I think it's just you know, yeah. limited thing. But you know, I'm sitting there with my wife, waiting to do this. Um, the uh, what do you call it? The where they they do it for you, and then they stick it in her, and then we have a baby. So, but I'm reading the Ister, right, of Heidegger. And the first opening, so I read, I read the poem, 
right? Um, which I didn't really understand it. And I felt like I really had to even, I would have to, I'd have to go over that a thousand times to, to I think where I could actually begin to comprehend what he's talking about. There were little moments of like, like when he talked about sign, somehow bringing in the sun and the moon and the horizon. And I was like, oh, that's something shakes there a little bit. But then, but then like the opening paragraph, um, I was noticing my experience of reading it, right? And my experience of reading it was where, and this is where I feel so grateful for Heidegger. Like I just feel so much gratitude for him because it's like, whether or not I'm getting the content of what he's saying, in order to try to get it, what he's, and this is what's, what's so interesting about him, in my view, is that what makes it difficult to understand is because he's bringing my attention to a place that is nearer than I normally look, right? It's like a, it's not this complex, complicated thing. It's actually is just talking about the the call, like you talk, you open it with the call, right? The, yeah. the call, right? Yeah. It is yeah. calling in the one sense, it's, it's your calling. The yeah. Call, he, he, which grants, he that like reveals the dignity of that which is the calling, calling it's like. Yeah. And he very often says also that we, it's, we have to return to where we already are. Yeah. It isn't, it isn't. I think often the, you start reading Heidegger, it's you know, what's being is this, this massive, wonderful thing that will come at some point. It's, it's always lingering. It's yeah. something very simple. Yeah. Uh, and very simple. And it's not very. going beyond and anywhere else. But oh. the strange thing is, and to quote Master Eckhart, uh-huh. why, I don't know, Gadamer quotes this. And this is how I know it. So I don't know where Master Eckert says it actually, but it's uh, the line goes, why, why, why do you go out to mm. return home? So we, we do have to go out and um, leave ourselves as it were, but we're already there where we need to be. Mm. But, we, but still we have to go out and that's the that's sort of difference. Mm self at work and that that's what we have to that's the struggle if you like yeah yeah well it's that and it seems like that there's a yo there's a kind of a yoga that like in following just kind of following the movement of understanding yeah it just kept having me get closer in closer in closer in right and that that is seems like and in some way like you're right, it's like, oh yeah, I get it, and then it slips away, right? And then I have to read it again, and, but there's this kind of sense of getting really close in, like closer and closer and closer and closer and closer, um, which I'm wondering about, is that, I, I think, that has just been so instructive for me, right? It's almost like where I feel and Marcel Ponte is really like this too. A lot of the continental people are like really like this, but like um, Ponte is really cool in so many ways. Um, he really is like that too. But this sense of just where it seems like, it seems like where it brings my attention, right? Is like the discipline or something or like the, or the practice of philosophy, right? Of how to live it. Like there's something about the way that you have to read it, right? And there, I'm thinking about there's something about that and the way that Gertz is talking about like reading nature as a kind of sacred text and giving yourself over to it fully and having it, those kinds yeah. of things, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, it's, um, my, my wife just got home. Oh, okay. Got it. I gotta make dinner again. Okay, good going. Should we um should we talk again later in August? Yeah, totally. You I mean I'll to... talk every day. I'll do this every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh 
yeah let's let's um yeah let's just email and yeah, then we do let's do that cool uh, mark we can also set up i mean whatever you want to do really we can set a text by heidegger that you want to talk about or yeah we, i i may I, i'll give yeah. you I meant to write you this. I have, I have a bunch of ideas about things that I think would be really interesting to do. Um, yeah, yeah. Like also with an eye on just wanting, I, I, I feel, I feel, uh, I want, I want you to have what you want to around like getting out of academia and finding a way to do this. Right. <laughs> I think there's a way, right. And I, I, yeah. I, I notice I want that for you. Um, Thanks. <laughs> so like, totally, totally. <laughs> Well, so there's some ideas about that, how to do that too, that kind of speak and, you know, kind of hooks into that some more too. Yeah. Let yeah. me, let me write those things out. And that would be good. Yes. That would be good. So we'll, we'll, we'll try, we'll try for late, late August maybe. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm traveling a bit now. I'm going to go hiking. Uh, yeah. And, and yeah, I, I, I'll send you some, um, I say I, I I included you in a mailing list now, so you know what I'm doing outside of academia and stuff like oh, that, like, like talks and whatever else. And right. by the way, there's a video on Heidegger coming out on Sunday. Yeah. On Utium and Heidegger, yeah, yeah. yeah. On uh, uh, leisure, idleness. Oh Utium. yes, good, good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right on. How is this for you? Very good. There are, you know, there are always these, uh, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit tired today because I had a very rough week when it comes to drinking, but um, <laughs> <laughs> I went out like four times and I'm too old for that, to be honest. Uh, it's, um, there are always these, there's moments. Yeah. Right. Uh, it was like, where, it, oh yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I hadn't thought of it. Or I hadn't, yeah. And it's meaning and mystery. Right. That, that's stuck. So there's always, I, I, I'm not going to say too much now because I don't know yet, but there will be in every good conversation. And there aren't many good conversations, right? Mm. But good conversations, they linger and then something comes back. Yes. And, and that's, that's the, the, the wonderful thing about it, isn't it? That you right. don't know what will stay, but something will stay. And it, and, yeah. And I think we, we've cr maybe we've cracked something with that concealment talk about Google and what they're trying to do. Right. I'm not sure, but maybe we keep, keep, keep we, have, we have to be super careful then. <laughs> <laughs> Using us like it's a little bitch, right? Like, <laughs> let's like. <laughs> right. Totally. Well, now if you start, if you start Googling, right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and you feel, you feel, more present you'll know why right yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. she's already in the kitchen starting to cook yeah, thank you please <laughs> thanks sharing 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 you and um i i look forward to meeting her oh. at some point oh, yeah yeah you will you come on see Absolutely. you soon bye bye ciao